If you are thinking about being a co-angler or need some more tips on how to be more consistent on the water and do better, stay tuned because this is how I get ready for my events as a co-angler. As a co-angler, you're bound by a set of rules that can make it really challenging on the water to be successful. But today, we're gonna kind of go through some of the things that you need to do to be more consistent, perform well, and actually start cashing checks as a co-angler. As a co-angler, you have to be more fluid. You don't know what boater you're going to draw, what kind of fishing you're going to do. So you have to actually plan and expect the unexpected. The first thing you have to do is prepare. So what I like to do is to do some research on the weather, uh, the water temperature, and sometimes I go back and look at my notes if I fished it before, or I look at other events on YouTube uh, that I can find to see if the conditions are matching what I'm facing that weekend uh, to see what the fish are biting. As the tournament gets closer and I find out who my boater is, I do put a lot of stock in researching my boater. So I'll go on to the MLF app, for example, and I'll check his prior performance. This is also the first glimpse that I get of my boater. So it prepares me to know how this boater communicates. Is it a younger angler who's fast and furious? Is it a pro that I'm just going to learn from all day? Or is it an old timer who likes to have a little bit more customs and courtesies and etiquette in play? Is he a listener? Is he a fast talker? Is he trying to win? Is he super serious? Is he not? Is he out there just for a good time? These are all things that you need to kind of get a grasp on when you speak to your boater for the first time. When I set out to actually start putting my kit together for the weekend, I don't like walking to the boat the tournament morning with more than two things. I only want my tackle bag and I want my rods. My tackle bag will allow me to have three boxes of lures, plastics, and I also like to put my snacks in there, my water, any additional clothing. You have to be a good packer in order to get all of this in and you have to pay attention to detail. Otherwise, it could be a rough day on the water. Yeah. Over time, I have discovered that I need good rod management. So not only rod sleeves, but also I picked up this device from Rod Mule over at Tackle Warehouse. I'll link it. The Rod Mule allows me to carry my rods as a suitcase, organized, and it can hold up to 10 rods. If I'm bringing my Gore-Tex, typically that means I'm gonna need it. It usually is in the morning when it's colder. For example, this weekend at Table Rock, the morning temperatures are gonna be 54 degrees. I'll wear this sun shirt, some shorts underneath, and some closed-toed shoes. And then on the way to the ramp to get in my boater's boat, I will wear my Gore-Tex just to have it out but I always have a plan of somewhere to put it once it starts getting a little too warm. Another thing to consider to bring is gloves, fishing gloves, and some sort of gator, fishing gator, nothing thick unless it's freezing, but to keep the sun off of your neck from getting sunburnt, you do that too many times and you could regret the results of having the sun beat down on you with no protection. I like to bring anywhere between four and six rods. This time of year, late summer, early fall, it becomes this junk fishing and you get that sensation that you need to bring every rod and every lure. When you're talking to your boater, I like to ask how many rods you think I can fit on the boat. Um, usually I don't ever have an issue. Usually the response I get is, well, you have to manage it, so whatever you think. Food, snacks, it all fits in my bag. I bring water, I bring some snacks, maybe, um, a protein bar, beef jerky, uh, maybe some nuts, maybe I'll make a sandwich. Also typically any of your food and drink options that need to stay cool, they offer you usually their cooler space in the boat. Etiquette. As a co-angler, if you've never done it before, there's a certain etiquette as a co-angler and certain rules that you have to follow. One, you can't walk up onto the bow to fish. 
If you're netting a fish, which is something you should always do regardless of how you feel about your boater, if you think he's cutting you off, you need to net his fish and he should likewise do the same for you. Good job. Thank you. Casting. We never cast forward up by the boater from the back of the boat. There are a lot of times where I want to cast to a certain place, but I always ask, always ask if it's okay, because the amount of cost that it costs for a boater versus what you've paid is tremendously more. Now that doesn't take away your importance uh, for your performance. It's just courteous to ask if you can hit a dock that's off to the left that he may be hitting, or if you guys are fishing, fishing fast, that you can cast forward and maybe drag your jig a little bit, but never cast up without asking, never cast to a structure that you think that you might be going to next. If you go out there and you're entitled and you are not asking and you're being aggressive or you're complaining that they're going down the bank and you don't have a shot at fishing, you are making a name for yourself. And believe it or not, you will be known amongst the boater community. When somebody draws your name, they're going to have an opinion about you if you are completely negative, if you are disrespectful, and no matter if you've changed your tune or flipped a new leaf, that day in the water is already gonna start off to be challenging. I'm not talking about just totally giving up your tournament day and the being a servant or a maid for your boater but there are certain things to do and not to do and if you want to have a good day on the water with your boater always ask one of the very first things that i like to do once i board the boat of my boater i always 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 offer gas money so day two i draw the 33rd place finisher on the boater side chris larkins Dude, this guy felt like he's been my friend my entire life. Um, I offered him some money for gas, didn't take it. First time that ever happened. Just a super nice guy. Nothing less than 20. It's usually 40. Half the time, they don't even take it. Sometimes they're grateful and say thank you. Sometimes they say thanks and just stick it in their pocket. But it really sets you up for the day to actually have a good experience and to show that person that you appreciate them being a boater and boating for you all day. One thing that you wanna be sure not to do is to text or call any of your family members and tell them how you're doing, uh, what you've caught, because that's against the rules. Potentially, that person that you contact can give information to different boaters and co-anglers on the water, and that is a big no-no. Let's talk about performance on the water. If your boater is throwing a certain technique, nobody's caught anything, I always like to try and fade what they're throwing. I throw something different just to try to find, you know, what the fish are liking that day. If I notice my boater starts to catch fish, it's a bad look to kind of pick up what he's throwing and start throwing in the general areas that he's throwing. That's something we don't do. Now, if it's lights out, he's just figured them out, I might switch to something similar, but I'm definitely not throwing up by him and I'm not casting at the same fish he is. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and fishing out of the back of the boat and I don't really throw forward of the center line of the boat unless I ask, unless he insists or she insists. Weighing in your fish. Now, if you have a bag of fish that you're gonna weigh, let me warn you, that filling up your bag too much can be pretty rough. The distance between the weigh stations and parking lots and the boat docks where you actually dock your boat can be quite far. And usually when you're weighing fish, you keep all your equipment in the boat and you just take your fish. But that doesn't make it easier because if you overfill a bag and you have to walk a 10th of a mile sometimes to get to the weigh station, um, with all the docks and the winding and, and walking uphill, it really beats you down pretty easy. Being a co-angler has so many advantages. I don't know if I will ever even be a boater. Um, maybe I will, but 
I enjoy being a co-angler because you get the opportunity to fish with people that are pros, that are guides, that are individuals that know the water, that know different techniques, that uh, have a different perspective, that maybe have they've been doing it for 20 years. And as a boater, I find that a little bit more unlikely of a co-angler. It's really important that you do your research and you prepare well because at the end of the day, you are still spending a good amount of money, $110 typically for your registration, anywhere between $30 and $100 in gas, lodging, food. It's not unreasonable to spend four or $500 as a co-angler going to an event, especially if it's a two-day event. It's important to still do all of these small things because you are still spending money and Yes, it is fishing. Yes, you're building relationships. Yes, you're outside. But you still want to give yourself a shot to do well. Good luck. Thanks for watching. Hopefully we'll see you out on the water.